All right. Hello, hello. Here we go again. Another live session for Sunday night here at the Watercraft Journal. And I'm your host, Kevin Shaw. And today we're going to go into some... <laughs> we're going to go into a little bit of uh, a pet subject I've been looking up. I've been uh, doing a little bit of homework on. And it just so happened to strike at the exact right time. And I figured, what the heck? Let's uh, the best way to the best way to learn a subject is to try to teach it. So here I am. I'm going to make a fool out of myself talking about some stuff that it's way outside of my wheelhouse. But hopefully, a lot of you guys will have will be able to pull something out of it and have some fun, and uh, we might learn something together. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, if you guys saw, uh, it must have been yesterday. We put up a post on the YouTube channel that we were going to bump back the 2021 Yamaha limited high output review just one day. And the only reason for that was that we were going to have this video go live tonight. And then if we didn't move anything, the Yamaha video would show up like four hours later. So what that does, unfortunately, is YouTube... Uh, YouTube doesn't like that. So they, they kind of throttle down when you might see something. So if you just crank out a bunch of stuff, it's like, okay, he's a robot and he's just dumping out content. So you want to space it out as much as you can. It's the way they operate. It's their algorithm. Um, I'm playing in their sandbox. And so I got to go by their rules. So, uh, anyhow, that's what we're going to do is that tonight, obviously, we're doing the Facebook or Facebook. I keep saying Facebook Live. We're doing the YouTube Live session. And then uh, tomorrow will just be a news article on the magazine. And then um, Tuesday at midnight, so Monday, uh, you know, Monday night, if you're staying up late, uh, you're going to see the video and article for the 2021 Yamaha go live. And then Thursday excuse me, Wednesday, I'll, we have one of our older um, older live sessions that we're still chewing through. And that one is um, going to be, let's make sure I get the right one because I've shuffled the order. Um, that one's going to be a short one. That's only about 30 minutes long. And I actually recorded it in my truck coming back from a location. And uh, that's just a little bit on how the Watercraft Journal as the website, web magazine, how it works, how we operate. Um, we get some guys who call us out and they call us shills or they call us, they say that we're bought out or whatever. And I'm like, dude, we're a magazine. That's what magazines are since like the beginning of time. So anyway, uh, I, I, that one's kind of a short one. I don't expect a lot of people would want to actually watch it, but I, I'm putting out content just so that you guys have something if you're bored at the office or at home. All right. So what's going on with this topic today is basically my suggestions for getting the correct top speed, um, correct top speed numbers. There's a lot of guys out there who are saying, hey, man, I'm going 65 or 70 or 75 or 80. And they're putting these things up on social media. They're putting them up in the forums. And quite frankly, they're not doing very good data gathering. They're not doing actual reliable speed gathering. So this is going to be a little bit of how to filter through, through the chitter chatter, how to get a real number and how you can report a real number that people can't argue with. Um, now, <laughs> obviously not all speedometers are created equal, and I say speedometers as being the actual speedometer on the machine itself. Uh, rule of thumb by me and most people in the in the industry, to be honest, is barely barely believe the speedometers. Um, I, I, I'm trying not to be. I'm not trying to come down hard. I'm not trying to trash them. But most speedometers, I mean, back when it was just the Dremo meter, you know, the paddle wheel hanging off the back, um, those guys were off 
Um, in lower speeds, they were they were off probably about one or two miles an hour. But once you got over 50 miles an hour, they were all over the map. And then we started seeing modifications to that. And they started getting a little bit better. And they would change the sensor. And they would get a little bit... They were inching better. Now, Kawasaki still uses the Dreamometer. And in a couple weeks, you're going to see a video of mine wherein... I go and do 443 miles on the Cumberland River on a 2020 STX 160 LX. And I have the speedometer and I have my GPS, which I actually brought right here is my 12 year old GPS. Um, and they're mounted right now. I mean, they're right next to each other. And in fact, it's the opening image for this video. So if you guys uh, were looking at it, uh, I, we've posted it and shared it. If you look closely, you'll see that the speedometer and the <laughs> and the GPS do not agree whatsoever. The speedometer is saying 65 miles an hour and the GPS is saying 59.8 or 59.9 miles per hour. And that was just to kind of illustrate that speedometers, especially the power, you know, the, the paddle wheel versions just aren't terribly reliable, especially once you start getting into the higher speeds. Um, Yamaha currently runs an altered version of the paddle wheel, wherein the paddle wheel is also met with an RPM, uh, the RPM calculator. And so it actually recalibrates and calculates and gets their speedometer off of that. There is a paddle wheel, but then there is also reading off of the engine RPM. And so it ideally was meant, excuse me, it was ideally meant to get the weird spikes that the paddle wheel would get. Sometimes you'd look at the paddle wheel and it would go, you'd be going 50 miles an hour and all of a sudden it'd go 58 and then 50. And you'd be like, what the heck is that? It, the paddle wheel is just really unreliable and it, it, it does offer a lot of weird spikes. Um, they call it an article uh, when we start getting into mapping. They call it a, 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 an, an article. So anyway... The Yamaha version was meant, or the current Yamaha version is meant to eliminate that unusual article, that unusual spike. So that's a little more information. Now, in 2018, most famously, SeaDo changed their GPS units, or, excuse me, changed their speedometers to a GPS confirmed speed. Um, and most people take that as gospel doctrine. They, they, they're like, that's, Moses coming down from Sinai with the Ten Commandments. They're like, if that ski reads 80 miles an hour, it's 80 miles an hour. Unfortunately, um, I'm going to prove to you tonight that the SeaDo GPS speedometer is very, very good up until about the high 50s. Um, once you start getting into the 60s and even higher, 60s is off by one or two miles per hour. Not bad. All right. It's really not bad. But once you get into the 70s, especially as late 60s into the 70s, you're off upwards to three to four miles per hour. When you get into the 80s and some of those guys who are tuning skis, do not, do not listen to what people are reporting when they get into the 80s because they can be off by five or six miles per hour. Um, and I will tell you that there is a major, there is a very scientific and very provable way Um to prove me right. I uh, <laughs> don't know how to say that any other way. Um, but that is to say that these speedometers do work within certain thresholds and they're not going to be that erratic. Um, they've just gotten better over time. Even the Cowie system, even the Cow, even the Kawasaki speedometer with the paddle wheel it is pretty good. Um, tack, I'm going to get onto the can do, by the way. Because the can do falls into a really good, a really neat little category. So hang on to that one. That's I'm thankful you brought that up. So um, we're going to kind of compare. Well, to be honest, we're going to let go of the paddle wheel systems. We're gonna we're just going to kind of not bring them up because ideally, what we're talking about tonight is quite frankly, guys who are modifying their skis, guys who are going top speed, who are who are dead set on having the best top speed. And getting that that number that they can wag in front of their friends and go, look what I run. I run 71 miles an hour. I run 74. I run 78, 80, 81, 82. 
So it's bragging rights tonight. We're talking about bragging rights. And I know a lot of you guys are like, I need to know what the fastest ski is so I can beat my friend. So here we go. Um, I'm going to say this and it me and I do so with a lot of respect. And I touched on it just a second ago was there are aftermarket tuners and aftermarket shops. Um, not the big boys. Reva reports all their numbers are GPS recorded and they do it with, um, uh, not only do it, they do it with a G GPS, they do it with typically with redundant systems. And by redundant systems, I mean that they're usually checking either a, a dedicated GPS and a, uh, a speed tracking app on a phone or two GPS units. They're not using speedometers. And believe it or not, once they have those numbers, and I'm going to just kind of let it out, is that <laughs> Reva actually sandbags their numbers. And the reason they sandbag their numbers, so they might have a kit that goes 83 miles an hour. They'll advertise it goes 81. And the reason for that is, quite frankly, variance. Um, there's too many variations when it comes to recording a top speed. Uh, and I say this to a lot of people. A lot of people don't listen. They get upset. They're like, I want a clear cut answer. I'm like, I can't give you a clear cut answer. All right. And here's the reason being is Reva. When Reva does their testing, they typically got Jesus Garcia out there who the guy's a marathon runner. He weighs maybe 155 pounds and you know, he's six foot and, you know, 155, 160 pounds. And they're on their private lake and they're at zero feet above sea level. So they're at exact sea level and they're in Southern Florida. So air temperature might vary and barometric pressure, which is altitude primary. I mean, no, it's not. But for this argument, it is what you would measure for altitude. And so weight of the rider, how much fuels in the ski, Barometric pressure, air, and water temperatures can have a huge impact on a top speed number. So if Reva sits there and goes, hey, we've got a kit that goes 86 miles per hour, they're going to advertise it at 82 because someone in... Whoop, knock the microphone. Um, someone in, you know, v Vancouver, Canada will get a totally different number. And they'll be like, dude this kit doesn't do crap. And, you know, they said, you know, if they advertise 85 and it only did 85 in Florida, that guy might get 81. And I mean, God forbid he's up in like Denver, Colorado, where it's, you know, a mile above the sea level. So again, these variants, these variants play a huge role. So when it, and I'm not going to tell you how to build that kind of stuff, but I am going to say how to track your speed. And tracking your speed ideally is done with, quite frankly, redundant systems. Um, when you saw the world, uh, the world record race, uh, the Hydro Drags guys, the Hydro Drags guys, if you look at their handlebars, they've got twin, typically they've got Garmin's, um, twin Garmin's mounted on the handlebars, and then they've got their phone with a, Jeep, with a, with a speedometer or a speed tracking software or app in the glove box. So they've got triple systems as they're running and doing numbers. And I don't know if they still do it. I presume they do, but uh, they used to have a guy on a radar with a radar gun or a LADAR razor, uh, LADAR uh, recording device, um, which is like laser radar. It's what motorcycle cops use and, and it's just a uh, police issue uh, speed tracking. So, that information right there is super important because ultimately what I'm trying to do is scream at you, just like grab you by the ears and shake your, shake your head violently is to say, do not trust what your speedometer is saying. And even if it's a CD, um, especially if you're in the 80s, 70s and 80s. So why do I say that? Um, these shops who are advertising, I can get you to go 87 miles an hour and they're only using the SeaDo speedometer with the top tracking number on it because you can you can toggle through the settings and say I want my top speed on there, and they go oh yeah this thing goes eighty seven you're like dude I don't trust it you can't you can't trust it and um quite frankly they're using that for prom I mean when they use those numbers for promotion it gets I mean the higher the number the sexier it is and it gets the people running to their front door and. 
I don't want to take business from anyone, but honestly, I'm, I, I'm doing this quite frankly to equip you so that you know what you're talking about. So I actually got my dry erase board and I did a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of pre-show prep. And we're going to talk about a lot of different terms and we're going to talk about a lot of different things in detail. So I'm going to use the dry erase board. That means I'm going to move this out a little bit. All right. So here we go. This is, let's see if I can't, I'm going to move the mic out over here. Actually, no, I can put it down low. Okay, good. All right. So again, here's our best speed tracking board <laughs> and here's our speedometers. So paddle wheel, if you guys can read this, you don't need glasses. I'm impressed So because my writing sucks. So paddle wheels, Kawasaki, an RPM calculator, also with a paddle wheel, is Yamaha, and a low-frequency GPS C-Do, is SeaDo. okay? It is a low-frequency GPS. And I'll talk about high frequencies and different frequencies here, and this is kind of where I'm going to lose a lot of you guys. But here I talk about frequency, neither of these, though, neither the Cowie or the Yamaha emit any sort of frequency. They're not data gathering at all. But the frequency off of the GPS is between 400 and 450 megahertz. All right. And we're going to talk about, well, actually, let's just get this out of the way. Here's at the bottom. If you can read at the bottom, we're going to use the word megahertz a lot. All right. Megahertz, for those who are not familiar, megahertz is 1 million hertz all right. And what is a Hertz? What's a Hertz? So a Hertz is a measure of the frequency of a radio transmission. So that is to say that if you have a radio signal that's emitting from a tower or emitting from um, any, well, let's just say a transmission. So it's being transmitted from point A to point B to its receptacle and back that is one cycle per second. All right. So while well, I'm trying to describe it for the guys who don't know. So, <laughs> all right. That, that transmission cycle from point A to point B back to point A is one hertz. A megahertz is one million. It's one million hertz a second. All right. That's really, really fast. So... The SeaDo GPS, the SeaDo low frequency GPS speedometer emits four, between 400 to 450 megahertz a second. Sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that sounds really, really good. So let's start looking at smartphones. So, ah, all right. So here's my iPhone 8, okay? An iPhone 8 operates on 4G or LTD, LTE, all right? Uh, unless you guys live in a 5G area. But previous to that, so let's say 10 years ago, all right? Well, no, 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 I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so smartphones. A smartphone, uh, I want to say about eight years ago, all right? A smartphone ran on AMPS, and AMPS is the Advanced Mobile Phone System, okay? And the Advanced Mobile Phone System operated, believe it or not, between 400 and 450 megahertz, so identical to a low-frequency GPS. That means that the speedometer in your SeaDo, your eight, 2018 and up SeaDo, was had the same signal strength, more or less, as a smartphone. But as smartphones got more and more advanced, they actually evolved and they evolved the system so that it runs on GSM, a GSM, which is the global system for mobile communications. All right. It's an advanced system, it, it more, more way, way more single strength and uh, was able to transfer a lot more data, a lot more information in those signals. Okay, and check this out. It actually runs typically on three to four bands, bands being levels, okay, or strength. I would say strength levels. All right, and they range, those bands range from 800 to 1800 megahertz. So 
huge jump, huge, huge jump. All right. And that is typically like a 4G or a 5G system. Now, here's the kicker is that your smartphone is not always peaked at 1800. Your smartphone will alternate and it will rotate or it will, I don't know the proper term, but it will alternate between those bands. So it's like, listen, he's not downloading a movie. He's not, you know, listening to music. He's not pulling stuff off of the cloud. So we only need the 800. But if you start doing, you know, if you're on your Dropbox and you're downloading videos or you're uploading a bunch of pictures or you're using a lot of data, it will start to peak you in like the higher band, you know, higher bandwidth. And the higher bandwidth is um, right for GSM. GSM peaks at eight. Actually, it's over 1800, but I rounded the numbers just for today. So that's why a phone and you download a good app on your phone, when you download a good speed app, and there's a million of them, and there's lots of free ones. So you don't have to ask me, like, which one do you use? Because I don't even remember which one. I have two of them. Um, I'll open up my phone right now, and I'll look at the apps if you guys want to know. All right, let's see here. Uh, GPS Speed is one of them. It's literally called GPS Speed. And the other one is called Speed Box. So I use those two if you guys care to have the same ones that I do. It doesn't matter. But there's some really good apps out there, and it'll do you fine. Okay? And for the most part, your phone will be pretty stinking correct. Way more correct than the factory C do. Why? Again, why? What's a factory operate at? Peak 450. Was your phone peak at 1800? Okay. Now, are it, that is, of course, if you have a good signal strength, you're at on a like a popular lake or downtown, and you got some really good signals. Now, here's where it gets a little interesting. How does a smartphone or a cell phone work? It's not a GPS phone. It does communicate to GPSs, but it bounces that signal in an analog signal to terrestrial towers to terrestrial lines. Okay. So instead of going from your phone into space and back, it's reading from the towers to the main tower that there is, you know, there's a dedicated tower that actually communicates to a satellite and comes back and commun and then it's got to come across all the signal towers back to your phone. So you've added some extra links in the chain, if that makes sense. Again, I'm, I realize I'm talking about high level weird stuff. So a smartphone is a lot better than this guy, but this guy, it, it's, when it comes to signal strength, but low frequency GPS, I try, I reached out to CDU. I didn't hear back from their engineer guys. If there is a, if I am incorrect, I will update this. I will change this. I will make a correction, but, and I'll mea culpa all day long because this is all kind of fresh stuff to me. I just started getting into this about a month ago. Um, well, no, a little earlier than that, but ne nevertheless, um, the GPS signal coming out of the sea is a GPS signal. It's a dedicated GPS signal. It is not a terrestrial line. Okay. So that's a big deal. There's a big difference there. Now we get into GPSs. Now let's see if you guys can read this without me having to lift it up really high. Okay. So now you have dedicated. Oh, let's put it on the table. Okay. Here we go. Um, there we are. All right. So let's talk about GPSs. All right. Global uh, global positioning uh, global positioning system. I'm going to move this over just a hair. Okay. So the global positioning system has been around since 1978. Okay. And it became public in the early 90s. So the Joe Schmo could go out and get, you know, a TomTom -tom or a GPS or, you know, any sort of just commercial grade uh, GPS system, early 90s, okay? But the global positioning system, uh, the, the global positioning system is actually really, really cool if you, if you want to get into that kind of stuff. And the global positioning system is more or less, of, well, it, the numbers alternate because they're always rotating them in and out, but it's typically 31 to 32 satellites that rotate the earth at six different layers, all right? Um, and that 
I think, yeah, they called them orbital planes. I thought that was kind of a neat, you know, or, neat thing. But there's um, there's six orbital planes or six layers that these GPSs are stacked at, and obviously they're moving at different speeds. Um, I before the video started, I actually logged into my GPS, and it gives you how many satellites your uh, your transmission is relaying from. And right now at seven or at seven o'clock my time. Eight o'clock Eastern Standard. Uh, I had contact with ten satellites, um, so that was really neat. That's you know that's to let you know that okay we're we're triangulating your signal, uh, your transmission off of ten satellites or you know whatever the nearest ones are. Uh, they don't need to hit all ten of them to come back. It's just ping 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 ping. Um, but uh, the big thing about uh, the GPS system is that the GPS system was updated into what's called GNNS, GNSS, all right? And that's the Global Navigation Satellite System. And the Global Navigation Satellite System is one of those really neat data gathering things where they just keep adding more and more information onto it. So it just keeps getting richer and richer and richer with information. Um, and that is why you have like, like on the Fish Pro, the Fish Pro has got a really neat um, uh, satellite GPS system on there. And that it can provide you so many different maps and so many different pages because of the GN, GNSS. And so that is why that, that encyclopedia, and it's now a library, that library of information is now in your hands to the public. Now, that's something really, really cool. Um, it actually came out of the NASA space program. And that NASA space program, I mean, the... the NASA, a bunch of stuff, a bunch of really, really cool innovations have come from NASA, and that's why space exploration is so important. And just, just for understanding how our Earth is, not even going to Mars or even further than that. But because of NASA, we have GPS. So, uh, and they're always rotating out satellites. Uh, some of them are decommissioned. Some of them have uh, better receivers, better transmitters. So they're always rotating them out. It's actually really, really neat. Um, so anyhow, let, I forgot to show you the Hertz numbers. So GPSs, uh, a, a commercial GPS, what you would buy is uh, they operate on two different, uh, well, there's three, there's a, there's a fifth, there's a L5. They operate on Lambda 1, Lambda 1 and Lambda 2. There's a Lambda 3, which is L5, uh, L1, L2, and L5. Um, but... I do not believe that's a public. Uh, I don't think that's available to, to you and me. But L1 and L2 are uh, a, ded a dedicated signal strength just for GPS, just for the GNSS. All right. And um, it's aver advertised as a, uh, as a 10.23 megahertz, but that's just because it's an integer. That's just because it could be round, it could be divided into it a bunch of times. So, what the signal strength of those two are, Lambda 1 and Lambda 2. Lambda 1 is 15, 1575 megahertz. And then Lambda 2 is a uh, is the closer signal for like closer satellites that are faster moving satellites. And that's at 1227. And those, those two signals are dedicated, all right? You're not rotating through that like your phone is. Your phone, again, is alternating its signal strength from, from 800 megahertz all the way up to 1800. And again, it's a terrestrial line. So it's ping ponging off of a bunch of different, a bunch of different towers before it gets to the satellite and back and saying, okay, this is how fast you're moving. The GPS on the other hand is constantly dedicated and it's constantly reading. And there's very, um, there's very few weird articles Meaning, you know, there's no weird, you know, in a curve, a speed curve, there's no, whoop, you know, weird jumps. Okay. And I'm going to get into the article graph real quick. Uh, that's actually the next thing I'm going to be talking about. Um, but again, it's really important to know your phone is more reliable than your GPS because it's got a really strong signal strength, but it's got a really long way to get the signal to you. Your GPS might not be as powerful as your 4G or your 5G phone, 
but it's a dedicated communicator to the satellites. I'm putting that in real layman's terms. So you guys don't, don't get mad at me. <laughs> I'm really dumbing this stuff down. Um, so let's go to the other side of the graph. Ah, okay. Whoop. I went too far. Okay. So uh, I got to back up. I made the graph too big. Okay. So shoot. I know the light is really flipping out the dry erase board. I'm sorry, guys. And it's flickering the camera. All right. So I did, I tried to color code this as best as I could. So I apologize, you know, for my visual aids. But green, that's marked here on the graph, would be your SeaDoo speedometer. Orange is going to be your smartphone, whether it's a Galaxy, a Samsung, or a, you know, iPhone, or whatever you got. Um, and then red is going to be your dedicated GPS. All right? What I have here is I'm trying, to I'm trying to illustrate your frequency. So as you climb in speed, your frequency begins to spread out. Does that make sense? So it, if you're you know, from zero to 10 miles an hour, everything's reading really reliable, all right? But the further you go up the speed scale, the further, the bigger the gaps in between your signal. Does that make sense? Okay, so your speedometer is just, I, I have it at increments of 10 miles per hour just to, just to seriously simplify this, okay? But it's gonna have these big gaps in between your acceleration curve or just your speed recording, all right? So what, ha what, does, this, what does a low signal strength GPS or a low signal strength speed recorder, whether it's the speedometer or your phone, um, uh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point about your fre frequency in front of you is faster than behind you. Uh, but that gets into the Doppler effect because that gets into inter interference. Um, uh, at least from what I understand. So you might want to correct me if I'm way off on that, but, uh, so a low signal, so a low frequency rate is going to have larger, wider gaps. So what happens is that inside of the computer, the computer says, well, we need to fill in the gaps. So it begins to round up or it begins to kind of, it begins to read all the articles, all the little blips and signals, and we'll try to average it out. So you'll just see a speedometer do this, but in reality, it's going boop, 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 you know, so it's just, it, the computer's trying to even it out. So that's where you get some really weird jumps. And guys might be like, hey, man, I saw my totally bone stock ski go 73 miles an hour. I'm like, mm, I don't think so. They're like, no, it did. I saw it. It's on my speedometer. I got it. it it's an article. It's a, it's a, it's an accident. All right. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> this is terrible. All right. So then you get into your smartphone and your smartphone has quite literally double, quite literally double the frequency. So now there's a shorter gaps in between its speed recording. Okay. So it's a lot more reliable. Now, mind you, even if, even at the 80 mile an hour mark, you're spreading out. So the gaps get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means now your smartphone is going to have to start averaging. Okay. That's what happens. Now on a dedicated GPS on a Lambda one signal, you have lots of little recording points. Lot, you know, your frequency rate is really, really high. So you're really moving along there. But even in the higher speeds, it's starting to spread out. Okay. So here's the question. Is there like, you know, what's the best, you know, the, the highest frequency rate? Um, I've actually did a little digging. And um, the best ones I can find are a lot of really high-end Garmin's. Um, I'm not trying to, this isn't, I'm, not, I'm really not trying to make it this an advertisement for Garmin, but you know, it's the most common brand when it comes to GPSs. Um, but then again, uh, it's really tough because a lot of times they don't advertise the megahertz because most people don't know what a megahertz is and they don't get it. And they're like, I don't know. What does that mean? So, um, but again, your Lambda signal, Lambda one, Lambda two, 
doesn't really change. Uh, basically, what makes a Garmin better than another one is its ability to average those speed numbers. Um, now, something I found that was interesting is that there's two products that might make speed recording for you guys a lot better, a lot easier, okay? And one of them was already teased, and that was the can-do unit, all right? For you guys who haven't ever heard of it, a can-do, like Can-Am and C-Do, a can-do is actually really great. It's a, I don't know if you guys can hear me with my microphone all, all the way over there. Um, the can do is actually a really neat unit because it's just a small, um, it, it's just a small wiring harness. And what you do is that you go in from underneath the dashboard and it interrupts the, uh, interrupts the, the dashboard harness from the main harness, from the main ECU harness. And inside of it has its own GPS transmitter. And so now you have a, and you can, believe it or not, I think there's, there's can-dos for Cowies, there's can-dos for Yamahas, and there's obviously can-dos for C-dos. And uh, those, I mean, I was, I mean, I know Jerry Gaddis sells them at Green Hulk at his store, and I know a bunch of guys who use them, and they're really, really, really reliable. Um, I'm still a believer in redundant systems. Um, that's the wannabe airplane pilot in me. You know, airplanes have a lot of redundant systems. So, um, I always say, always have your GPS with you. If you're out for those kinds of, those kinds of numbers, a can do unit in your ski would be great. And, you know, in your Yamaha or in your Cowie or in your older Sea-Doo. And cause I do you, I don't think you can put a can do on a 2018 and up ST3. If I'm wrong, correct me, but I haven't, I didn't do my research when it came to the can do's. Um, Excuse me, but believe it or not, the signal strength of the can do, and I asked Jerry and he simply did not know, um, but I did do some, some kind of around the back end research and it looked like it had the same signal strength um, as uh, a low frequency GPS, which would be about 400 to 450 megahertz. So it's better than nothing. Um, but it is not better than the factory C do, um, 2018 and up again, I have to emphasize 2018 and up C do, uh, now the other one of course is the V box and the V box V box made its name in the auto industry for, you know, the, the high end racers and like the guys who were drag racing guys who were doing like the flying mile and the V box is quite frankly started life as an accelerometer and that was to help uh record g's uh lateral g's acceleration cornering uh, as well as acceleration uh acceleration speeds and the v box uh the software in the v box now what's interesting is that the v box software um the larger end units believe it or not have uh do you know if the garment it comes with it is easy yeah oh no uh billy <laughs> that's a terrible last name uh billy that 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 garmin uh that fish finder is out is outstanding and it's super easy to use and you can toggle through all the pages on the fish finder you should love it um i think you'll really like it but uh okay that was all right sorry uh but anyhow, the V box now there's a portable one, a sport one that's kind of it's actually waterproof or water resistant. Uh, that's what Jerry and I used in our shootout that we did like two years ago between the GP and the FX against the RX TX 300. And that V box, uh, that signal strength or the um, the megahertz frequency strength of that is. I think they were average the they were having the advertising theirs at uh 1680. Uh one is it was there was a 900 and there was a 980, then there was a 1200, and then there was a 15, 1680, I think was the high-end V box. 
and they all share the same software, do not know if they share the same transmitters. And that is going to be the make or break. But the V-Box is an absolute killer when it comes to recording acceleration speeds and getting top speed. Um, but I do believe it is also using uh, the, um, not the, I think it's using the GNSS. It's not using terrestrial towers like a cell phone would. So that's why the V-Box is really preferred among a lot of racers. Um, so if you guys are really serious about checking out top speed numbers, V-Box is the way to go. Now V-Box is 400 bucks. Um, just the, just the little cheap one is 400 bucks, but it's killer. I mean, it's, it's undeniable. It's killer. So like if you had a Garmin handheld and a V box, you're unbeatable, uh, when it comes to the, the, the efficacy of your speed recording data. Um, but now that I've told you a lot about signal strength and the higher the signal strength, uh, the more accurate the number is going to be, the less guesswork in that in that number it's going to be. So hopefully that's been a, cleared up a little bit. Um, the CDU the CDU is good. Again, the CDU is good. I'm not trashing the CDU, but uh, you don't think you could access cell towers without paying for access? Um, it could be it, it could be a lot of different things. There there are a lot of emergency signal programs that access all the cell towers. In fact, home security systems are using terrestrial towers. Um, there's just contractual deals that happen. You don't, we don't, I don't know if V box is cutting a check. Um, and, uh, you know, V box could be cutting a check to whatever the cell tower provider is and they get a smoking deal on access to the towers. So again, I don't know. Um, but, I will tell you that the um, the most important thing when it comes to this data recording is, and I, I, I hate saying this because a lot of guys don't know the difference, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna help talk about it. Is peak top speed versus sustained top speed? Sustained top speed will always be lower than peak top speed because peak top speed more often than not is either a misreading an article on the GPS or on the speedometer that gets a, a weird blip and we'll be like, oh, okay, you went 75. You're like, no, you don't. You go 72 max. You just happen to get a blip, uh, uh, you know, again, an article on your GPS reading. So that's a lot of times people go, oh, peak top speed. No, all right? What you want is sustained top speed. So the best way, it, uh, the best way if you're a caveman, the best way if you're really unsophisticated, but you have a GPS, all right? If you have a GPS, I'm actually going to boot this up. You're going to hear it chime. But the best way to record your sustained top speed is while you're hauling butt on some glass water and you're tucked down low and you're going as fast as you can, all right, is to go to, here we go. All right, so here's your data gathering page. It's dark because it's night out, but go to menu, you reset it. And I know it's impossible to do this while you're going full throttle, but your moving average, you can clear this as you're going and it'll give you a sustained top speed, all right, for as long as you can hold it out. And the problem is, is that if you do it too long, your engine gets heat soaked, it starts to, it starts to back down, it starts to ease off, um, you know, there's a lot of different things. That's why it's ideal to do a quarter mile or, you know, a eighth mile race, eighth mile race, quarter mile race. But that's also why those guys who do the flying mile and they record and they announce their numbers are so impressive because the numbers that you're getting out of the flying mile guys who like do them out of Texas are so impressive is because they're sustained top speed. 
you know, a guy goes out there and you'll laugh, but it's like, okay, a guy last year went out there with a Hellcat Charger, which is, you know, 4,600 pounds. It's a battleship, four door, you know, four door Charger with the aerodynamics of a frigid air. And the guy does a flying mile and he peaks at 204 miles an hour and the car is bone stock. And it's like, you're telling me I got a supercharged four door Dodge that goes 204 miles an hour. I can turn this off now. It's beeping at me. Batteries are low. Um, so again, sustained top speed for the hardcore performance guy is far more impressive than a peak top speed because a peak top speed can be a can can be an article, can be something weird. Now I'll tell you why that's interesting. Because I reported peak top speed when I reviewed the 2021 SeaDoo RXPX, um, the RXPX 300, and I used my Garmin, but I did not do sustained top speed. I read my peak top speed. Now I read, I recorded three peak top speeds, and they were all in the set high 73s so of 73.5, 73.6, and 73.8. Well, which of those three would you report? Well, 78 or 73.8 is the sexier number. And that's what we recorded. That's what I wrote in the article. That's what I put in the video. But I also said that's a peak top speed in ideal conditions and with an international tune, not with the domestic tune. It's not going to do that. All right. So it's really important, again, to call people out and make sure that you have your all, all your ducks in a row when it comes to getting your top speed numbers. All right. So again, I'm beating a dead horse, but redundant systems, a GPS, you got to have at least one GPS two superior because it's really neat when you see those hydro, you know, those hydro drag guys and they've got two GPSs and they're identical numbers because that means one, you know, one of them is not reading a weird peak, and the other one's reading a different peak. They got identical peak top speeds. That's really, really, really impressive. Okay. Those guys are going 135, 137 miles an hour. That's impressive stuff. That's really, really impressive. Okay. When a guy shows you a, a cell phone shot of a dashboard of an RX TX and says, hey, man, I'm going 83. I'm like, mm, really? Are you really now? So... That, I'm not trying to be skeptical and I'm not trying to throw you know ice water on anyone. But again, when someone starts advertising, especially like a shop, a shop or an aftermarket advertiser, you want to know how they got that number. That's important. And unfortunately, some people kind of squeak by by saying, well, it's, G it's a GPS confirmed top speed. And they're using the low frequency GPS off of the CD. So... I mean, again, I'm beating a dead horse. All right. Well, that really is all I had for today. And that's the shortest lesson I've given. So I'm going to go through and ask que or answer questions. If you guys have any questions for me, go ahead and fire them out. It does not have to be about this topic, but I'll do some Q&A for a little bit. And um, yeah, yeah, I think I, oh, yeah, no, I talked about upcoming videos. Okay, so we got that covered. Okay, we're in good shape. This might be the shortest one we got. But let's go look at some questions here. Um, here we go. Do, do, do. Let's see. Want to see a Yamaha GP1800R and CDU, I presume RXPX, uh, go at it. Um, if I do another shootout, it will be with Jerry. I'll go down to Louisiana. We'll record it. We'll use the V-Box and um, redundant GPSs. And it'll just be... the. It'll be identical to how we did it last time. But this time around, um, I actually have... I have it in my mind to siphon out as much gas as possible and, and manually pour in like four gallons or three gallons each and just do it, you know, minimal gas and have Jerry be the rider... And we'll do it, do them both with uh, um, uh, launch control because both have launch control now. Okay, so Joe, that's that's kind of what if we do it, that's what how we're gonna do it. Okay, uh, tell us what my favorite jet ski is. Uh, SXR eight hundred. 
That's my favorite jet ski. All right. Um, do, 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 do. I got three GP 1800s and all the odometers are off. The odometers or the speedometers? I presume you mean speedometers. Um, TAC was right. What about the CANDU? The CANDU is a really good unit, especially for um, CDUs that are, you know, that, that are pre 2018 ST3s. Um, so you can put a can do on like a 2020 RXPX. It'd work great. Um, and they work really good. You're going to get numbers similar to what you get with the, with the current new CDU um, low frequency GPS speedometer, but it's better than what a paddle wheel will give you. All right. Uh, what do the speedus max out? Add for the big three, 85. Well, uh, digital, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you go through, go in through the map tuner, um, the map tuner, I believe, can let them read whatever. Now, I don't know when you start getting into the high 900 or high 90s, because I really don't think the guys who are doing 135 miles an hour are seeing a speedometer read 135. Um, but I just don't know. I don't know what the maximum is on those. So that's, you stumped me on that one. I don't know. <laughs> um, Oklahoma, I'm down four miles per hour. Yeah. Um, altitude, barometric pressure. Uh, density of air density is, uh, is a killer. Um, it's a killer. Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Frequency. Okay. Uh, just ordered the Fish Pro. Uh, pretty sure they don't have one for the 19 and up FX. Glad they snuck in the wonder wheel. Uh, they stuck with the wonder wheel in the, uh, 21 GP. Again, I don't know if there's a can, if there's a can do system for those. Um, if there are, that'd be really cool. Um, because that would radically improve the reliability of those numbers. <sighs> I was told I was told CDU is giving three year warranties this year. They might. I don't know. You're going to talk to your dealerships. I'm not a dealer. I couldn't tell you. Um, I can't wheel and deal. Um, what Garmin unit would you recommend? Um, it depends on what you're doing. If I mean, I'll tell you what, man. I do so much long distance riding now that if I if if I had a full size CDU. I, I tell you right now, I'd put uh, uh, the Fish Pro head unit and the Fish Pro, what is it, six, uh, seven point six inch screen? Um, yeah, the GP, not the GPS scape. It's the, um, is it a GPS scape or it's the Fish Finder? I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head, but I would basically just replicate the Fish Pro system and put it on any SeaDoo because they all have the same mount that replaces the right-hand side review mirror. I do that in a heartbeat and it's easy. Oh, Oh, CDU. CDU has the best wiring harness. I'm telling you guys, Oh, CDU has got the best wiring harness because the wiring harness is a Swiss army knife and it works for everything. You want to put a sound system on a factory sound system on after the, after the fact, boom, easy. You want to put heated, you know, the heated grips on boom. Harness will take it. You want to put the uh, USB port on your ski and it didn't have it before, plugs right in. Whoever whoever engineered the wiring harness deserves a pay raise and a Coke. That guy's great. Um, yeah. So if, if I had a SeaDoo and yeah, if I had a SeaDoo, I'd end up putting that thing on there just for my use. Now, if you're just doing it for top speed, there's a lot of handheld units that are small and tiny, don't weigh a lot. And, and if you're not using it for a map, but you're just using it for speed recording, there's some tiny ones that are smaller than a cell phone. They're like this big. Um, I don't know the name of it, but I'd go with Garmin. I'd go with Garmin. And uh, yeah, it's a, they're, they're made domestically. It's an American company. Go with Garmin. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really good. Um, if I was, if I had to see do that, I was going to mount a GPS onto, I would just replicate the fish pro system on there because the, it does everything you want it to. And it, you can 
map courses on it. Now, mind you, I go out and I ride with some guys who've got like massive Lawrence units that are like belong on, you know, offshore fishing trawlers. I mean, super, super detailed systems. Um, those are really trick too. If you want to do a Lawrence, Lawrence, not Lawrence, but Lawrence system. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen a lot of really, I mean, there's guys who have GPS units that take up the whole dashboard. They don't even see their dashboard. It's, it's wild. It, it's really wild. Some of the, some of the setups I've seen are really trick. Um, all right. Can you give us your thoughts on the redesign of the Yamaha clutch? How has it improved? Uh, I detailed that in the article. And what they did was that they were having slippage problems. And what uh, I believe it changed from uh, the, not only the diameter changed, but they also went from 24 teeth to 27 teeth. And that's going to give you a lot more bite, less slippage. So um, the, the question was, okay, well, you're not making the boost at the high end, but I think what the goal is, is that the, the one-to-one ratio is the same. The final ratio is the same, but the mid range, and this is something Jerry and a lot of people who've been on them, who've ride them and test them. Um, the mid range on the new GP is where it's at. The mid range pole on the GP is demonstrably better. It, it really is. Because, I mean, it's not about getting the top... It's not about top speed and going, woo, it's fast. It's getting to the top speed that's a different animal. So that's why... Uh, that's why it, it it really does make a difference. Um, let's see. Can you talk about your 400-mile trip? How is the Kawasaki on a long trip like that? Um, yeah, I can talk about it, but I got two videos coming out. Um, in fact, after the VX limited, it is going to be the Kawasaki Cumberland ride, the 440 ride. And, um, how the ski road, I'll, I'll, and, and going into that, um, it's still an STX. And so it behaves like an STX. Uh, the only thing that's really interesting is that in my, in, in, redesigning the deck and the seat of the STX for the new STX 160s, um, the center of gravity is higher. They, you, the rider is literally up like two inches. And what that does is, believe it or not, and I saw this on Mudbug when I, when I, because when I first wrote it, my first introduction to the new STX was out in the Pacific Ocean. And just beating the crap out of me for two days on the Pacific Ocean. Um, but my second go around with the ski was at Mar was at Mudbug, and Mudbug's primarily glass. And at top speed, wide open. What was wild was that because of the center of gravity, the ski can't find its running surface. It's I mean. It's not wandering. It's not unsteady, but it it rocks, and it's just not. It hasn't found its happy space. And it was funny because I was talking to a couple of guys who, well, I was talking to the guys at K Speed, and they're like, "Oh, that that clears up at seventy miles an hour." I'm like, "Well, I bet it does," you know. But stock, it only goes fifty nine and change. Um, but. Yeah, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, once you start getting into the, once you modify and put 300 horse at it, it evens out. But uh, that was unusual. Um, I still totally hate the glove box. Um, not only the glove box door, because it just flaps and it, it's a pain in the butt to lock, um, but accessing it when you're on a ride is kind of tough. Because um, not only do you have the door like this, but then you have a secondary waterproof door that opens up. So... It, it's still a little wonky. Um, Sea-Doo's glove box, especially on the GTIs, is still is still pretty damn good, uh, especially when it comes to a waterproof case. Um, but uh, I got to say the Yamaha FX, to me, has the best glove box because the door, 
Um, the latch is really easy once you get used to that stupid rubber. I mean, it's weird because you're everyone who expects expects a latch is like totally put off by the rubber, you know, hook on it. But once you get used to the rubber hook and getting it to work right, you don't complain. Um, and I love the glove box, the padded rubberized glove box on the the FX. So I don't, that's a weird tangent. Um, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to steal the thunder from the two videos we got coming up on that, on that ride. But um, the reason the STX was the weapon of choice for that ride was because of its twenty and a half gallon tank and being small, naturally aspirated, twenty and a half gallon tank and being small. Okay, uh, let's see here. Do do do. Why no catch can factory? Oh, why doesn't the factory CDU? I presume we're talking about CDU. Why is there no factory catch can? Because they've got a positive crankcase uh, valve on it. They got a PCV valve on it, and typically a PCV valve does a decent job. Yamaha's PCV valve and their and their evacuation system on the 1.8 liter has no problem. There's no blow by in that motor. Um, Cowie not Cowie's pretty good too, um, but the C2 PCV valve and the evacuation system on it. I don't know whether it's the three cylinder just produces a ton of crankcase pressure. Uh, I don't. I kind of know that when they went to the electroplated sleeves from the press in sleeves, because you know the aluminum aluminum engine block used to have stainless press in sleeves where the pistons ran up and down inside of the sleeves, the cylinder sleeves. Well, to save weight and machining costs for that matter, they went to a plating. So the sleeve or it's not sleeved. The cylinder is, is um, got a really thick heat treating coating on it. Problem is that wears I can't give you a number, but it wears a lot faster than, say, a press-in steel sleeve. So what that means, though, is that the piston... Um, I can go over there and get my Hemi piston if you want. Um, the piston doesn't have such a tight tolerance over time, and that boost from the supercharger starts to blow past the sides of the piston and starts to pressurize the crankcase. So... The crankcase can fill up with air pressure and fuel and unspent fuel and carbon really quickly if there's a lot of really hard hours. If the, you know, SeaDo has like the really uh, aggressive break in process and Yamaha doesn't and Cowie doesn't, that's primarily to seat the rings. It's not so much the bearings, not so much anything else. It's so that the piston rings will seat naturally inside of the sleeves and if you don't do your break-in process correctly you can can not will but can um misalign not misalign that's not that's not correct but the rings won't seat as properly all right and what why that is is because of heat cycling you know metal expands and shrinks when it gets hot when it gets cold that's everyone knows that um, they want you, you know, that's why they're saying alternate the speed and go, you know, 20 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. You know, they want you all over the map because they want you to heat up, cool off, heat up, cool off, heat up, cool off. They want you to do that so that the pistons, the, the rings around the pistons will seat nicely with the cylinders. But I mean, that, we can go down the rabbit hole on that one on a later day. That might be something we can talk about later. Um, but the factory catch can cost money. Cost money. And if you're the accountant who figures out how to save 10 bucks off of every unit sold, you might potentially save the company a million bucks. So then they give you a pay raise in a corner office. That's how businesses work. Um, all right. Jason Bourne. I just picked up a brand new old stock Delburn. Oh, Delorm. I've never heard of Delorm. Uh, I mean, it's a GPS, but for twenty five bucks, that's a killer deal. I've never heard of a uh, Delorm. I'll have to look it up. 
Uh, hi, is it true that the Riva ride plate gives you an extra five, oh, five kilometers per hour beside the improved ride on the FX HO? Um, <clears throat> I do not have the speed numbers of the plate on the HO. I have the speed numbers on the SVHO. Those I can tell you. The ride plate, the ride plate on the 2019 FX is good for minimum two miles per hour. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, and primarily because what the ride plate does, the ride plate on the FX, believe it or not, the FX naturally, the let's say this is the bow, this is the tail, this is the transom. Naturally, the hull, the hull attitude was down and it would nose plow through the water. Okay. It would just naturally do that. So that's why when you started pushing tons and tons of power to it, it got real squirrely. You lost the tail. The tail was all over the place to the point that racers and seasoned riders were scared out of their mind out of it. So what they did is that they changed the ride plate so that the ride plate extends the wetted surface and the pitch that naturally brought the nose back up, offloaded the, you know, altered the attitude and brought the nose up. All right. And it gives you a slightly, 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 slightly drier ride. So I would say, I mean, listen, if you're looking for speed, I'd put the Riva ride plate on. I'd put the Sponsons on and the ride plate on. You could do the intake grate. But the intake grate is pretty good um, because it's a copy of the Riva. That's why. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I'd put the right plate on tomorrow. I'd do the right plate in a heartbeat. So, yeah, uh, Ahmad, totally do it. Totally do the right plate. Tell him Kevin sent you. All right. Got another one for Jason. Linked your video on the Yamaha gas tank. I think I will remove the check valve one. Oh, um, yeah, the... Again, here's the problem. When you start messing with fuel systems, you get phone calls and emails from corporate going, dude, what are you doing? Don't, don't teach people how to do that. Um, but what's funny, check this out. If you get a chance, go look at a 2021 FX. You don't, need, you don't have to pull the fill neck out of it, but if you can pull, just pull the, the bulkhead, you know, the small little divider wall, peek back there. What they did, what Yamaha did, they did not get rid of the check valve. They did not remove it. But what they also did, they ran a secondary, a secondary vent line to the mechanical siphon line, to the, to the natural, the, the factory gas tank vent, ventilation line. They ran a T into that. So why do they do that? Why is there an extra T? Why add two, two new hoses? The point was, was that now as you're filling up, any air that's trying to evacuate, it's evacuating out of the, out of the vent line. So now it's breathing better. So that you're not getting that burp of air because that's what was happening was that, that that fill line would have a pocket of air and the gas couldn't get past it. And so it would literally burp gas back at you. You're like, oh my gosh, and it bubble up. And I mean, I got covered in gas a couple of times um, just because I was at like a, you know, I was at like Kroger getting gas and just going, because the Kroger pump just, you know, pumps like a monster. It's pumping like, you know, 110 gallons an hour. Just, and uh, um, yeah, I got get covered in gas because, and I finally I was like, okay, I can't take this anymore. And I took the, I took the, <laughs> I took the check valve out and it takes like five minutes to do it it's super easy um but again it's a precautionary for rollover it's a precautionary for fuel spillage it's a warranty thing you know they, they you know they don't want anyone getting in trouble with that so um that's why in the video i say hey listen put it back in you know or i or i say i put it back in ours um just so that they want yamaha will get mad at me all right, let's see here. Uh, hey, Billy, what's going on? I think we're done. I think we're all said to go, um, unless anyone has any more questions. Uh, guys, uh, 
I will say that um, really appreciate the help with the growth and sharing videos. You guys are awesome. We really appreciate you sharing videos. That's the quickest way to get the word out. Um, if you do want to support the channel, if you do want to support what we do, um, we have some really nice swag. I know I always say it in every video, but we got. Uh, I was wearing the hoodie all day yesterday, um, and then you know representing the shirt today. And and if you go to watercraftjournal.com, we still have uh we have like five of the turquoise shirts. You know the the you know the light blue shirts, um, and we have a ton of stickers left. And it's it's two for one. If you buy one, we'll send you two. So it, it, we didn't say so on the website, but I'm telling you right now, if you buy one, we'll send you two. Um, but Rick, oh Rick had a question. Uh, I don't see Rick. Do you think you could access cell towers without paying for access? Uh, I already said so. I I gave you my answer. Um, it just. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I already gave you my answer in regards to accessing cell towers um, and what, you know, what products would use them. So um, anyhow, because it's a utility. And so a lot of people will tether into that utility. All right, guys, I think we're good. I'm actually going to come in, not even, you know, not even at an hour and a half, but less than that. So that's really, really cool. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one. It was a little different. Appreciate you taking the time. To make the videos, Billy, it's my pleasure. I love you guys that you guys tune in and you're doing this with me on a Sunday night. Um, hey, if you guys want topics for videos, topics for videos, because I'm kind of scraping the barrel a little bit when it comes to some you know heavy tech stuff. If you want me to go down the rabbit hole with some tech stuff, I'm happy to do it. Um, I am boning up on prop pitching. I don't think I could teach. A, I don't think I could do a Sunday night session on prop pitching because there's a lot of voodoo in there, and then there's a lot of variables. Um, but yeah, I, I I wish I was the team at Scat Track that could tell you all the secrets, you know, about prop pitching. But and I, I know I've had that come up. Those guys asking me about prop pitches. Um, but the only thing I can say about uh, about props is. If you find a soulless prop super cheap, it's a Chinese knockoff and it'll peel apart. It'll tear itself apart. Soulless props are worth the money. So if you're going to get a soulless prop, don't if you find one for $30, it's it's a Chinese knockoff. Jerry Gaddis, Riva Racing, uh, Watercraft Superstore, reliable names sell the authentic real McCoy soulless props. I want to get the word out because there are guys out there who are going on Amazon or they're going on eBay and they're buying a soulless prop for 15 bucks. And they're like, dude, this is a killer deal. I'm going to spend 15 bucks on a brand new 1321 prop. And then it tears itself to pieces and they go, what the hell happened? It's because they bought a Chinese knockoff. Um, but yeah, Michael, I wish I could. I don't, I don't have a lot of the science to it. Um, I really don't. I could actually go into pumps better than I can go into. Um, I could go into pump technology more than I could go into prop, believe it or not. Uh, but anyhow, um, I will continue doing more homework on prop technology and prop pitching. But again, I don't. I don't think that's a topic that I'm ready for. But if you guys think of a really fun topic, leave a comment. Um, I'm. I'm game. I'm game. You know, uh, I'll, I have a master list and it's right here on my pegboard and I can just check it off. We can have some really fun topics. So anyway, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate you tuning in. Um, when the Kawasaki 440 mile ride video comes up, uh, I will be pitching doing it again and inviting all of you to do it. But again, it'll be 440 miles in one day. And it's wide open throttle and we don't wait for you. We go because you only have a window, but I, I am, I am going to be strongly considering 2021 doing that as an unofficial, it'll be a ride and it'll not be an insured ride. So it'll just be like, Hey, join me for fun. 
But if you beat me and make it back before me, um, the first three people to do that might get something for doing so. Um, that's that is as stealthy as I can pitch a potential event. All right, guys. Thanks again. Have a good Sunday night. Make sure to check out uh, Watercraft Journal. Obviously, all we you know always check out Watercraft Journal. See all of our articles. But we're also going to have the 2021 Yamaha VX Limited HO review for bright and early Tuesday morning. And then we've got uh, the uh, other pseudo live. I mean, it's not really live. It's pre-recorded. Um, live session going up on Wednesday. So we've got three videos this week. This one and two more. Thanks again, guys. Have a good night or a good morning to you guys in Australia. We'll see you soon.